In this video, we're going to look at the governing equations of fluid flow and heat transfer in convective heat transfer situations. We're going to look at the non-dimensional governing equations, and then we'll think about the functional form of the solutions that we'll use subsequently to calculate heat transfer from surfaces to moving fluids. Finally, we'll talk briefly about the Reynolds analogy. If we want to solve a fluids problem, we have a number of different ways of doing it. We can either use analytic methods or empirical methods. In analytic methods, we're coming up with a model of the system and coming up with equations which we can solve to understand the behavior of that physical system. In the empirical method, on the other hand, we're running experiments and we're digesting the data from those experiments to create correlations, potentially, or to, to put that information into the best format for somebody to use. We'll start by looking at the analytical equations. We're going to come up with the differential equations that govern the fluid flow in our convective heat transfer, and those, of course, are the Navier-Stokes equations. We're going to use those equations in order to figure out what the functional form of the solutions to these equations will look like so that we know what the correlations that people should make with their experimental data should look like so that we can use them to the most advantage. And that's what we'll see subsequently in the course. So the governing equations are, of course, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and conservation of energy. Let's look at the, each of these quickly. So conservation of mass, if we draw a two-dimensional control volume here, and we have a u-velocity in the x-direction and a v-velocity in the y-direction, we have flows going into our faces and flows going out of our faces. And if we sum those up to, say, to, <laughs> sum those up to show that mass is conserved, we'll see that perhaps we have the potential that the density is changing inside our volume, so maybe the mass is changing because the density is changing with time, or the mass flow, rho times u, which is carried in through the x faces, is different than the rho times u being the mass flow being carried out of this face. So we have the difference of rho u, or the derivative of rho u with respect to dx, and similar in the v direction, if we have a difference between the mass flow carried in at this face and this face, that will contribute to the mass balance and we have this term corresponding. So our conservation of mass equation uh, for a compressible flow with the density changing looks like this, and if it's incompressible, we can pull the density out of this and divide all of these terms out, and we're left simply with the divergence of the velocity, or du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. Conservation of momentum is a little more complicated, but it's not as complicated as it seems. Conservation of momentum, of course, we have to think about Newton's second law. ma is equal to f, or the acceleration, the acceleration is equal to the time derivative of the velocity, and here we use the material derivative because we think about fluids in the Eulerian frame. That is, we're sitting at a point watching the fluid go past us, and the correct frame of reference for the derivative is the material derivative. And of course, we want to divide this by the volume and deal with a fluid problem, so if we divide by the volume, then we get the density multiplying the material derivative of velocity is equal to the forces that are acting on the system. And what we'll consider is the pressure forces, and we'll get the pressure gradient again because it doesn't matter what the level of pressure is, it only matters if there's a difference in pressure between this face and this face in the x direction that will result in a net force. It has to be a difference, and that's what this dpdx is showing. Likewise, we have shear stresses in all of these faces, and it's only the differences in the shear stress that cause a net force in this, so we get the divergence of the stress tensor for the shear stresses, pressure forces, shear stresses, and perhaps we have body forces. The body force that we'll consider is the weight of the fluid, and so we add the body force here as well. Expanding that, if we have a steady flow and we relate, we introduce a Newtonian fluid, that is a linear stress-strain relationship that relates these shear stresses to the strain rates. Uh, then we get this equation here, it's steady, so from the material derivative we only get the convective part of the acceleration, but we have the density times the acceleration term coming from here is equal to the difference in pressure forces, the net pressure force, it's the viscous forces for a Newtonian fluid, looks like this, and the body force rho times gx. So it wasn't so hard to go from F equals ma to our Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, and of course, that's a vector equation, so we can look at the x component and the y component. The x component is where we put u into all of these differentials. Then the y, and of course, the pressure gradient with respect to x, and the x component of the gravity vector. And in the y component, we put v in each of those terms, and we take our derivative with respect to y, and we have the y component of the body force. There's our momentum equation. And now we want to think about conservation of energy.
So far, when we've looked at conservation of energy, we've looked at conduction. And we've used a control volume like this to come up with our conduction problems, where we have the conduction in and the conduction out. All we're adding here is now advection. We have a velocity that's moving through these faces as well, and that's carrying energy, that velocity times rho times CPT, is the energy that's been carried in by this velocity, and likewise is an energy carried out here by the mass flow at this face, uh, rho times the area times the velocity times the CP and the T uh, at this point here. So putting that together, we have a term that looks very much like uh, the acceleration term in our, in our momentum equation, or in our F equals MA equation. We have the difference in the energy that's carried in and out of the control volume by advection in the two different directions. And we have that being equal to the, to the conduction term that we're familiar with from our studies of conduction. And because of those uh, forces that we have in there, we have the possibility of viscous dissipation, which is where the organized kinetic energy of the flow is being dissipated via friction. And of course, that's resulting in some heat generation. And then we could have our classical Q dot, our generation term, which is the conversion of other forms of energy uh, into thermal energy, uh, obviously not including viscous dissipation, which we have here separately. And I've just written, written the expression for viscous dissipation in case anyone's interested in that. So we put this all together, we get our conservation of a mass equation for a steady, incompressible Newtonian fluid with constant properties. We have our x and y components of the momentum equation, and we have our energy equation down here with all of those terms, the advection, the conduction, our generation, and our viscous dissipation. So in order to solve for the velocity and temperature profile, we now have four equations that we can solve, and that's good because we have four unknown variables. We have the two velocity components that we don't know, we have the temperature that we don't know, and we have the pressure that we don't know. So we have a complete set of equations that we can solve in principle for all of these variables. But rather than doing that for now, let's start to think about these equations and end up figuring out what the functional form of them is going to be. I'm going to start by neglecting viscous dissipation and gravity. So I'll assume that there's no conversion of other forms of energy, there's no viscous dissipation, or the viscous dissipation is negligible, uh, and we're not going to consider gravity. And I want to note that our momentum equation, here our x momentum equation, looks very, very similar to our energy equation, with the exception of we have the u component of the momentum in here, and here we have the the temperature in this equation. So we expect at this point to see strong parallels between the heat transfer performance, or the way the temperature field looks, and the velocity field. So these equations are very, very similar. We'll explore that a little bit more. Dividing through by the density, I can move my density over here. When I divide the viscosity by the density, I get the kinematic viscosity. And I've divided through by the rho Cp here to get my alpha here on my conduction term in the energy equation. And again, we can see the form of these equations is very, very similar with the extra appearance of the pressure gradient here. And the coefficient that is, that is multiplying the viscous term here is the kinematic viscosity, whereas the coefficient that's multiplying the conduction term in our energy equation is the thermal diffusivity alpha. Okay, I want to think about non-dimensionalizing these, and we'll non-dimensionalize them like this. The velocity, any velocity component will be uh, normalized by the free stream velocity. So here's an example of a boundary layer flow where we have the flow impinging on a surface and far away from the surface we have our free stream velocity u infinity. So we'll non-dimensionalize those by, uh, uh, with u infinity. Any coordinates x and y will non-dimensionalize with say the length of our plate. We'll pick a length scale. In this case it would be the length of our flat plate. Uh, the pressure will normalize by dividing by rho u infinity squared. So rho u infinity squared has the same units of pressure, so that will result in non-dimensional pressure. And our temperature will take the difference between the temperature at any location and our surface divided by the maximum difference t infinity minus ts. And we'll start to put these into our, non into our governing equations. So non-dimensionalizing the conservation of mass equation doesn't result in any changes. If you work through that, you'll see that we simply have the exact same equation in our non-dimensional variables. However, when we non-dimensionalize the momentum equation, we get an extra length scale coming from non-dimensionalizing uh, this term. We get the u infinities coming from this term. We get our u infinity squared coming from this term, and if you work through that and show that, if you work through that and see where all these extra terms from the non-dimensionalization are coming through, what you're going to find is that we get the exact same equation with our non-dimensional variables, except we don't have the 
uh, density term here, which has been absorbed in the non-dimensionalization, and we get 1 over the Reynolds number multiplying the viscous term here. So you can see that as the Reynolds number increases, of course the viscous terms become less and less important as compared to the uh, inertia terms or the acceleration terms, as we know from the definition of the Reynolds number. And you can see that clearly in the governing equations. A large Reynolds number, less importance of the viscous terms. And finally, non-dimensionalizing the temperature equation, not surprisingly, this is going to look very similar to what we had in the momentum equation, except that we had an alpha here where we had a nu here. If you remember the definition of the Prandtl number, nu over alpha, that means that in our energy equation, we'll get 1 over the Reynolds number times the Prandtl number, multiplying our conduction term. And so now we can investigate the functional dependence of all of these in our non-dimensional form. The reason we're interested in non-dimensional form is if somebody's going to run, go to the trouble of running an experiment, they don't want to have to do it in water and air for every different size of their geometries that they want to look at for a sphere of one centimeter diameter, one meter diameter, 10 meter. If we non-dimensionalize it appropriately, they can provide that information for the flow over a sphere, and we can use that in any fluid that we want by bringing it back to dimensional form using our Reynolds numbers and our Prandtl numbers, etc. So let's look at the functional form then. Clearly, if I want to talk about the velocity, u star, the x component of the non-dimensional velocity, it's going to be a function of x star, y star, the non-dimensional pressure gradient, dp star dx star, and the Reynolds number. I'm not so interested in just the velocity when I want to know my total heat transfer from a surface. What I want to think about is the heat transfer and say the shear stress. So the shear stress is given by mu du dy. And by taking the derivative at the surface, because we're interested in a quantity at the surface, and it's the same with the heat transfer, we'll look at dt dy at the surface. It means that we're getting rid of this y variation because we're only interested in the gradient at that surface. And so the the non-dimensional shear stress is given by the friction coefficient. We non-dimensionalize the tau wall by rho u infinity squared divided by 2. And if we go through this, we can see that that's equal to 2 over the Reynolds number times the non-dimensional velocity gradient. But the point of that really is that we've gotten rid of the y variation by taking that gradient at the wall at a particular y location. So our friction coefficient is a function only of x star, the Reynolds number, and the pressure gradient the non-dimensional pressure gradient. Of course, there's a star there. Similarly, we know that our Neusselt number is the non-dimensional temperature gradient at the wall, and by the exact same reasoning then, we know that our Neusselt number is going to be a function of x star, Reynolds number, and the Prandtl number, and our pressure gradient, which is coming about because of the geometry that's in that flow. So we expect this variation, but now this is the local quantity, it's a function of x. If we want to calculate the total heat transfer from the surface, we need to integrate the local variation over the entire surface, or we need to get the average value over the entire surface. And so if we average this to get an average value over the surface, of course we're integrating over x star, and then the average doesn't have a variation on that position. So the average friction coefficient, or the average Neusselt number describing our heat transfer process, is simply a function of Reynolds number, Prandtl number, and the non-dimensional pressure gradient. And the friction coefficient the same, but without the variation, without the functional dependence on the Prandtl number. Now, we know that dp dx, the non-dimensional pressure gradient, is determined by the specific geometry. If this thing were a hill instead of a flat plate, we would accelerate the flow on the front end and decelerate it on the back end, and that would result in pressure variations in our flow. So if we specify the geometry, if we say a flat plate, we're specifying what that dp dx is. If we say it's a cylinder, it's a different dp dx, but we're specifying how that variation is. If it's an airfoil, it's yet again different. So if I talk about one specific class of geometries, like a flat plate or like a cylinder, that's fixing this term. And so I can then say for a specific geometry, my friction coefficient is going to be a function only of the Reynolds number. And my Neusselt number governing my heat transfer, the average Neusselt number governing, governing the overall heat transfer from the surface, is only going to be a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. So our experimentalists who are determining these things experimentally should correlate their data to some function of the Reynolds number and a Prandtl number for the particular geometry that we're looking at,
and then we can use those to calculate the heat transfer from those surfaces provided we're in the right range of Reynolds numbers and Prandtl numbers that correspond to their experiment. If we go outside those ranges, we could have very, very large differences and the answers could be completely and totally wrong. But if we express the answers in non-dimensional form and we're within the Reynolds number range and the Prandtl number range, we now have a very nice way of capturing the information that we need for any fluids and any size of geometry. And so what we'll see as we do convective heat transfer is it's a matter of finding that correct correlation for the Nusselt number that is corresponding to our flow condition and our flow geometry so that we can calculate our heat transfer problem. Finally, I'd like to make a quick word, I'd like to say a quick word about the Reynolds analogy. And the Reynolds analogy, not surprisingly, comes about because of the similarity of the momentum equation and the energy equation. If we have a situation where the pressure gradient is zero, and of course, if we have a flat plate flow, the pressure gradient is zero. So if the pressure gradient is zero, then that disappears from my momentum equation. And what I see is that this equation and this equation are of identical form. And furthermore, if the Prandtl number is equal to one, that is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid is equal to the thermal diffusivity of the fluid, then they are exactly the same form. And that means that knowing a solution to this, say, for example, I know the skin friction coefficient because I have a solution of this, means that that specifically determines the Nusselt number as well because this equation is of exactly the same form as this. So the Nusselt number can be determined directly from the friction coefficient in that case. And what we also find is that even if we relax these, these assumptions, if we have a, some pressure gradient and if the Prandtl number isn't exactly one, we can, of course, find a relation that is pretty good over a certain range of these variables. And that's what the Reynolds analogy is about.